Hey, howdy all. Welcome on into Goose Talks Film. Uh, this week, our episode is something a bit different. Uh, we're not doing a new release film like I have done the uh, first few weeks. We're actually tackling uh, a movie that's just over 20 years old. And we are talking about the 2003 South Korean film Memories of Murder. Uh, yeah, just to preface this, if you haven't seen this, watch it. <laughs> that's probably, like, you know, that's going against what I usually do where I leave my uh, recommendation before uh, the spoiler territory for people that haven't watched it. Uh, I just have to say, just watch this. If you can or can't handle subtitles, I think you should watch this. It's just over two hours. It, like, it, it, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll touch on this even more, but it's crazy how many people haven't seen this movie, including myself. I thought I'd watch this, but turns out um, I'd got a shoddy copy about 10 years ago, and uh, it was just unwatchable because the sound wasn't right and blah, 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 blah. So I, I told myself I had watched this, and I was scrolling through uh, crime movies and stuff and this popped up and I'm like have I watched this I don't know if I have anyway so I, I bought this on Prime uh, for a decent price I almost like I'm pretty good with having a sixth sense of knowing if I should buy a movie or not because most of the time they're $15 or more on, on Prime Video unless they're on sale for a bit less but I have never bought a movie on Prime that I wish I hadn't paid X amount of money for and oh god I wasn't disappointed paying $15 for this let me tell you that uh, yeah, so if you haven't, this is uh, Bong Joon-ho's second film. Uh, if you don't know who Bong Joon-ho is, that tells me that you're not a film nerd and you're just a, a movie watcher, which is fine, but uh, probably most famously known, especially in um, American, Australia and other Western places, uh, he's known for directing and writing Parasite, which was a pretty groundbreaking film um, when it won a lot of major categories at a lot of major award shows. Uh but a lot of people consider Memory, Memories of Murder uh, Bong's best of a film. Uh, he, well, he has a, an amazing list of movies. Uh, I'll just get them up for you. So, did a lot of shorts to begin with. Uh, and then he had a movie called Barking Dogs Never Bite, which was released in 2000. That was like mixed to positive reviews. And then he did Memories of Murder in 2003. Uh, that just skyrocketed him to fame in South Korea and then overseas. Uh, this movie was probably one of the biggest Oscar snubs of all time. Like, I truly do, man. It, it wasn't nominated for anything. It wasn't even nominated for Best Foreign Language Film. And from what I gather, South Korea did nominate this as their entry. I could be wrong. But if they didn't, then they're idiots because this is just amazing. <laughs> Then he did uh, quite a few more shorts, and then another big, big movie of his, which got him a lot of uh, credibility overseas, was The Host. Uh, if you haven't watched that, watch that. That was my first ever Bong Joon-ho film when it first came out. I was only about 11, 12 years old. And then he did Mother, uh, which was another well-received South Korean film. Then he actually did a, uh, I'm not sure if it was a joint project of Snowpiercer, uh, sorry, of America and South Korea, but it's Snowpiercer with Chris Evans. That's probably... Uh, the one that a lot of Western audiences are probably more familiar with, and there was a TV series, but he has nothing to do with that. Oksha, which a lot of people might be familiar with because that was um, the only movie that he's done that has been released uh, through Netflix. And then, of course, he did Parasite in 2019, which a lot of people regard as one of the best movies of the past 10 years, which I find hard to disagree with. Anyway, back on to Memories of Murder. I just want to just talk about Bong as, as best I can because we'll touch on him, but he's just incredible. Uh, so, Memories of Murder, released in 2003, uh, in a small Korean province in 1986, two detectives struggle with the case of multiple young women being found raped and murdered by an unknown culprit. Uh, so, if you're a bit squirmish with this type of stuff, I don't recommend this, but um, it's not violent, like overly violent, I should say. It's not like a horror movie. You don't see a lot of blood. You don't see a lot of gore. Um, you don't see any of the actual rapes, um, which is obviously a big positive for a lot of people who makes them squirmish, rightfully so. Um, it does obviously dive into some pretty hectic territory, though, um, where they do discuss um, some of the bodies, and you do see snippets of the bodies. Most of the time, they're covered up, but you do see them. Um, that's all I really want to say without giving them away too much while we're um, in spoiler-free territory. Uh, yeah, so this is based on a true story, but I will preface that with saying that um, and Bong has said this as well. Most of the crime scenes and the actual murders and rapes themselves are pretty well 100% accurate. 
Um, I don't know in terms of chronological order or anything like that, but uh, that is 100% true. This is the first documented case of uh, serial killing uh, in South Korea. Uh, so it's a pretty monumental case. Um, in terms of the suspects, the cops, most of that is relatively uh, fictionalized, except for the fact um, it shows you some incompetence of the t- of the police department. And Bong has said that that was based on what was happening um, at the time in the 80s. Uh, yeah, I mean, this cast is just incredible. I'll touch on them a bit later. But uh, yeah, so... This movie was made for just under $2 million, um, American dollars. Not sure what the conversion is if, if that's... Uh, I don't think it's a relatively big budget, especially for 2003. I don't think that's an inflated sum, so that's what it cost back in 2002 when it was getting made. Um, yeah. All I can really say is, is I know a lot of people uh, can't handle watching subtitles if they don't have concentration or they... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll run out of things to say. If they can't concentrate or if they struggle to uh, read the subtitles and watch the movie and understand what's going on without like kind of stressing out and missing anything, what I will say this, and I don't say this about a lot of foreign language films, is I forgot I was watching subtitles. Like, you know, honestly, I, I didn't think about it after probably 20 minutes, half an hour. It, didn't, it really didn't cross my mind. I was just so engrossed and sucked into the movie that I literally forgot that I was even having to read subtitles. Like, it, it really didn't matter in the end. A bit like Parasite, but I felt as I was probably a bit more engrossed in this one. But I'll touch on the comparisons a bit later on. So, yeah, this is just over two hours. I think uh, there's only one uh, cut or edit, whatever you want to call it. It's about two hours and 12 minutes. That's including credits. So, you're looking at, not you know, just over two hours uh, of film. And this doesn't have, like, mind-blowingly amount of dialogue either. The, you know, there's plenty of dialogue because, you know, they, they're detectives talking to each other and whatnot, but it's not like you're speed reading. But then again, I'm actually not sure because, like I said, I was so engrossed, I forgot I was even watching a foreign language film with subtitles. Uh, so for a lot of people, that might matter. Other people, it won't. If you're not sure, like you only watch some uh, subtitled movies, I really, really can't say anything other than watch this, give it a go. You don't, you don't have to buy it off Prime View, you can rent it, you can actually rent or buy this pretty much anywhere you get your digital media. Uh, there is a uh, Blu-ray and DVD was uh, released in 2021, I believe. Obviously, physical media is unfortunately dying, but you would be able to get this somewhere, even at second hand or off eBay or Maybe even places like Sanity or JB Online will have it. They still have their warehouses open for physical media. So, we even want to pay. I I bought this for $15. Every cent was worth it. Just let me tell you this. Uh, yeah, that's all I really have to say. That's all I can really uh, recommend. Uh, I usually go by my three categories of recommendation, which is go to the movies, don't watch it at all, or um, wait for streaming. Obviously, with this... Kind of the same, either like, you know, don't watch it at all, uh, watch it included in your stream, like don't pay extra, like watch it on Netflix or something, or rent or buy this. Uh, rent or buy this. Because this is really hard to get your hands on. Like from what I gather from research I've done in Australia, uh, at least, it's never been on a streaming service. I think it has aired on pay TV or even SBS over the years, but it's never actually been available to watch on demand. Um, from what I can gather. Maybe a long time ago, it might have been on World Movies on uh, Fox or something, but then again, that's kind of before uh, streaming us up, but they probably replayed it a lot overnight so you could record or whatever. But yeah, that's all I'd like to say uh, before we get to the spoiler territory. If if you are a crime nut, you love crime and you love movies that are based on true crime, I cannot recommend this enough. Like I truly, really can't recommend this enough. Uh, for the budget they made it with. Uh, back then, you know, South Korea wasn't spending a lot of money on their um, film productions. But this is just, you'd be amazed. Like, for people that love probably more so Seven than Silence of the Lambs, if Seven is one of your favorite movies or you just love it, like, th- this is a great movie to watch. It's 
And I'm not saying that it's copy and paste or that it's, uh, you know, a carbon copy or anything like that, but it's got the same vibe. I hate using that word in 2024, but it's just the truth. It does have the same vibe. It does have the same feel. Um, although, you know, probably a hot take, but I would say this is probably the better overall movie and better directed. Uh, and it doesn't have, doesn't it doesn't need a shock ending like Seven. Without getting spoilers for either films, it doesn't, like Memories of a Minute doesn't need a shock ending. Okay, so I'll finally leave it there uh, before we get into the spoiler territory. Here is your warning. All right, so let's delve, delve, dive, delve, I don't know what I'll do. Let's dive into this phenomenal movie. Uh, it's just like I'm just seeing it. Like I can't wait to rewatch this movie. I'm hoping to actually dissect this in a YouTube video uh, when I start doing that a bit more often on my YouTube channel. At the moment, I'm just tackling podcasts and then I'm going to uh, not transition because I'll still be doing the podcast, but then also doing uh, like in-depth kind of highlight videos, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes worth. Uh, this would be a great one to tackle. And in terms of uh, reviewing older movies, this was one of the first ones I wanted to cover on the podcast just because... I was actually going to cover uh, the Bob Marley movie, Bob Marley One Love, this week. But unfortunately, none of the session times coincided with me before I had to get this podcast out. And I wasn't putting myself through the pain of watching Madam Web. Because <laughs> they were the two new movies that we got uh, this week at my local cinema. So I thought, hey, this is a great time to tackle an uh, older movie. So yeah, and it's just over 20 years old, like I said. Um, I am actually going to read the in-depth plot of this. So please bear with me for a few minutes. I'll try to read quick, but not too fast. You can understand what's going on. Just because I think if you don't think you can handle watching a subtitle movie or a foreign language movie, and you really want to know more about this movie and listen to me dissect it, then I, I think you will benefit from me reading the entire synopsis. And it tells you everything major you need to know so you can kind of understand it. Hey, maybe... And maybe... Even hearing the spoilers and stuff might even change your mind about you want to watch this movie because I didn't. I'm probably speaking from a different uh, stand standing point because I didn't know anything about this movie in terms of plot or any twists and turns or anything like that. Not this movie really has a lot, um, but yeah. I'll, here is the plot. So uh, please bear with me. In October 1986, two women are found raped and murdered on the outskirts of a small town. Local detective Park Du Man, not having dealt with such a serious case before, is overwhelmed. Evidence is improperly collected, the police's investigative methods are suspicious, and their forensic technology is near non-existent. Park claims he has a way of determining suspects by eye contact. He questions a scarred, mentally handicapped boy, Park Quang Ho, because he used to follow one of the victims around town. Park's partner Cho beats confessions out of bake. Seo Taeyun, a detective from Seoul with more scientific training and crime scene analysis, volunteers to assist them. However, his and Park's methods clash. Seo determines Bake is too weak and scared to commit such an elaborate crime, and after closely studying the crime reports, deduces that the killer strikes only on rainy nights and targets women wearing red. Inspector Kwon, the police force diligent but unrecognized female officer, also has uh, determined that the same obscure song is requested on the local radio station on the night of each crime. Despite a stakeout, the killer eludes them on the next rainy night and kills women near a gypsum mine. The next night, Park, Cho, and CO stake out the crime scene and interrupt a man masturbating there. After a chase, they apprehend him, thinking he's the killer. But despite their beating him, his improvised confession never fits the details of the crime. He does mention a mysterious person who rises out of the outhouses at a local school. This fits with a similar story that two local schoolgirls told CO on the night of the most recent murder. CO investigates the story and finds the killer's only surviving victim, a traumatized woman living near the outhouses. She tells him details that exclude the man arrested at the crime scene. Park and CO fight when the man is released, but when the killer strikes again, they agree to work together. Their investigation leads them to Hun Gyo, a handsome clerk at the Gibson factory who originated the song request. CO notes that Hyoju's hands are soft like the survivor had described and that Hyonju moved to the town around the time of the first murder, but they have no other evidence to go on. Listening to Burke's confession again, they realize that he had seen one of the murders as it occurred. 
They go to the restaurant run by Bag's father where they encounter a drunken Cho, who has been suspended from the police force for beating Hyun Ju. When other patrons mock the police for not solving the crime, Cho instigates a brawl. Bag stabs him in the leg with a rusty nail, then runs off. Park and Seo chase him, but before they can learn what he knows, the frightened Bag stumbles in front of a passing train and is killed. Park feels guilty when Cho's leg develops tetanus and will have to be amputated. The coroner discovers semen in the last victim and CO arranges for the sample to be set to the US for DNA testing that will confirm if Hyunjo is the killer. On the next rainy night, CO loses track of Hyunjo while surveilling him. One of the schoolgirls CO had befriended becomes the next victim. Enraged, CO attacks Hyunjo the next day. Park interrupts him with the results of the DNA test. They are inconclusive. Hyunjo is neither confirmed nor excluded as a suspect. Seo tries to shoot Hyunju anyway, but Park stops him and Hyunju is allowed to leave. In 2003, the crimes remained unsolved and Park is now a father and businessman. He passes by the first crime scene and stops to view the spot where the first victim was found. A young girl tells him about a man she had seen there before who had said he was reminiscing about something he had done there a long time ago. Park asks the girl what the man looks like and she tells him that he looks very ordinary. Shaken, Park stares into the camera. And lights on. <laughs> so that is the synopsis for Memories of Murder. There's a lot of tackle as you've uh, listened to, and if you haven't or have uh, seen the movie, uh, I just want to say I noticed something that was just an incredible touch, and I think it worked really, really well. Was the opening shot and the closing shot are in like a corn? I think it's a cornfield, but it's a field of some description. Obviously, very yellow, a bit green. Uh, so that was shot normally, and it's a dying technique that you do to film to give it, you know, vibrant colors and stuff like that. Well, they're the only two uh, scenes that were done like that, like properly. The rest of the movie, you know, pretty much two hours of the entire movie were actually dyed and done in a different way to give it a very bleak, um, dull type looking. Uh, and that's to, I guess, emphasize when uh, the victims are wearing red, and we only ever see one victim actually get attacked, which I think is a really good touch. It doesn't overdo it and show you every victim, you know, because that would take up a lot of time. And they also don't kind of screw the audience over by not showing anything at all. Sometimes that can work. We have seen that work. Shows that as for you, you never ever saw the crime happen, not even in a flashback. And that worked quite well, but in certain cases it can and can't work. I really like uh, just Bong's, his attention to detail. When he was making this movie, when his first feature film was released, he actually spent six months working on this movie, but it was literally just research. In terms of researching the crimes, researching other cases, researching the South Korean detective department and, and the police force, researching like different film techniques. Like we've seen directors blow people away with their debut feature film and sometimes they don't release a movie as good if the expectation is too high now or whatever it is or it's just like maybe unfortunately I know a few directors that not got lucky but they were given like a golden goose or a unicorn so to speak Bong's second movie he like it is just and it's crazy and the run that he's gone on with the host and Parasite specifically, and Mother as well, great movies. And you have Snowpiercer that was obviously a great choice to do an American movie with an American leading star uh, in Chris Evans to get his name out to the audience. Because then when Parasite came out, he was already kind of well known. But yeah, to tackle back uh, <laughs> of memories of Meta, I keep just going to talk about Bong Joon Ho, but it's it's hard not to. He's just he's amazing. So. As, as I was saying, I'll kind of jump around a bit. Uh, when it comes to, yeah, them showing the crimes, you, like a lot of other movies, you only really see the cops get to the crime scene. They look at the body. You see bits and pieces of the body. Most of the time, they're covered up. Same as in the morgue. We get a few snippets here and there. But then uh, when the movie's starting to get closer to its climax, they start to, the intensity is really ramping up and you're on the edge of your seat. There's a phenomenal scene. Like, the, like I cannot tell you how much I fucking love this scene. It, it, it is 
And this might be recency bias because I watched this, you know, a week ago and I took a lot of extensive notes and I've, I have gone back and watched certain scenes again. So I've watched this scene multiple times. Is when it's raining, they've figured out some parts of the killer's modus operandi. They know kind of who he attacks, when he attacks, that, that sort of thing. And it's this woman. We meet this woman. At first, I was kind of confused because she looks um, and dresses similar to uh, who we think is the main character's wife or girlfriend, like Park's wife or girlfriend. It turns out it's actually a prostitute, and they're actually not meeting in, in his apartment. It's actually a brothel, which blew my mind when I found that out. But anyway, she looks similar to her. So I actually thought, oh, shit, are they, are they killing off his, his partner? But no, it turns out it's not. Uh, it's a woman that... Uh, Needs to do a, a run. She's doing her laundry, and I quite can't quite grasp why she goes out in the rain. But she goes out in the rain. She goes to put on a red coat, and that tells us, okay, she's listening to the press that's talking about this because she never addresses it. She never says or looks in the mirror and says, oh, shit, I better not wear red. She puts it on. She's about ready to go, and she looks, and she takes off and puts another jacket on instead. But anyway, she leaves. She's got a torch. She's walking in this, like, middle of bumfuck nowhere, like, in this field uh, on, like, a little dirt road. And it's near, uh, for I gather, it's like a factory or, like, mills in the distance. And that's kind of the only light that she's getting. There's no real natural light at all. It's just rain. It's darkness. And she looks very frightened. She's looking around. And then in the background... Like, you just kind of notice it, but it, you do definitely notice it, but just, it's just amazing directing and cinematography. And the head pops up from the field behind her, and then it drops back down, and it cuts to her different, uh, different, sorry, cut of her. She's walking, and then she stops, and it's like close-ups, incredible close-ups on her face, where she's like shocked, like she knows someone's watching her, she knows something's going to happen. It then cuts to her clutching uh, the umbrella and the torch like really tightly and you see her feet kind of plant like she's getting ready to really take off and run and then boom, she takes off and then within, uh, within about three, four seconds, there's uh, like a long shot of her sprinting and it cuts to her and it cuts in front of her and this man appears like he kind of turns and uncrouches himself and he springs himself at her from the bushes and then it quickly cuts Oh, it's this scene. Like, I cannot stop thinking about this scene. And everyone's got, like, one of their favorite movies or movies they love, and there's always one scene that pops into their head as soon as someone mentions it or they mention it. For me, like, this movie, for all its amazing scenes and stuff it's got, this is just incredible stuff. Like, I would love to see Bong lean, like, fully into the horror, do like a full horror. And you could argue the host is like that, but I mean, just like a full, full, full gory horror that's kind of doesn't lean into like supernatural or anything like that. Even if it's just, I don't know, like another murder mystery, but it's full horror because this scene just, it really teases you and you just want more and more of this, but he doesn't give that to you and it's good. Like he doesn't overdo it with this scene. Like, if if we'd gotten like the carbon copy print of this three or four times throughout the movie, it wouldn't have the same effect. Just seeing the one victim get attacked, and you don't even really see it get attacked. You see it get stalked. You see him lunge, start to attack it, and then it's over. And then they they find out there's another body that he had actually dragged all the way up the hill and raped her and stuff. And that's when that uh, worker gets caught. Uh, masturbating on the grave, which is like, not a grave, sorry, but where she, her body was found, which is really fucking like, fucked up, seemingly really weird. And this movie has kind of like weird aspects of comedy, but it's kind of like, it's not disrespectful comedy, like they're making fun and like being silly in a movie that's kind of focusing on, you know, rapes and murders. It's kind of like comedy, like, oh shit, that shouldn't be funny, but it kind of is because it's ridiculous, but actually true, like, there's a scene when uh, Park gets to one of the crime scenes very early on in the movie and everyone's trampling on the crime scene. They, no one knows what the fuck they're doing. They just let a farmer drive through on his on his tractor and he runs over one of the only 
parts of physical evidence they have, which is a footprint, and he completely fucks it. They, <laughs> the coroner is... Because it's kind of like in this ditch. It's not really like a canyon or anything that big, but it's kind of like a little ditch. There's like a bit of steep hill that goes down to it. And Parks walking to the crime scene in the distance, in the front of him, you see the who turns out to be the coroner, slides down and tumbles and gets up and then kind of brushes off as if nothing happened and then talks to Park about the case. And then another forensic person does the exact same thing and stumbles and falls. It, it, it's them showing you like, oh, like, will this crime get solved? And they do an incredible job with Park. Our main character, the, the lead detective, is he keeps talking about he's got shaman's eyes. He can look at someone and all look in their eyes and tell if they're guilty or not. And you think, oh, wow, like this detective's, you know, he's kind of like the Jodie Foster of this movie. Like he might be a bit underestimated or maybe he's a different type of detective. Like he's got this really big reputation because he solves these amazing crimes. Well, yeah, that's not the case at all. It unfolds slowly throughout the movie, but we understand that he's really, really fucking incompetent. And he doesn't give a shit if he ruins, not so much ruins the crime scene, but more so plants evidence or puts innocent people in jail if it's just so he can get the case closed. And that slowly progresses worse and worse and worse, or should say regresses worse and worse. And then it gets to a point where he then becomes the level-headed one and says, no, we need to do the right thing in terms of uh, CO wanting to shoot uh one of the victims, can't remember his name, and one of the victims uh, when they're in the uh, train tunnel. Speaking of trains, that scene with uh, poor uh, Bark, I think, yeah, Kwang. They call him Kwang, I think. But anyway, when he gets hit by the train and Park is covered in blood, that's kind of like the most gruesome thing we see. And it's not even one of the murders or rapes. It's just a very unfortunate accident. And it's really messed up scene because you start to really feel like sorry for this Kwang kid. Like he's a bit creepy and a bit weird, but he is mentally handicapped and he's deformed and he does talk about girls laughing at him and adding at him, sorry, or or looking ill when they look at him. It it's it's a very like confronting, like fucked up scene. And him being their only witness as well. And then it, then it happens because he gets scared off after the brawl and stuff. It's just, yeah, it's kind of like one of those big I don't want to say fuck you, but it's like a big like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, you thought that was a big twist, yeah, that, oh, yeah, it was a really good twist that it turns out that when uh, Bark was uh, falsely confessing that he was actually a witness, that's why he knew all of the details, and that's what CO, and, and we kind of, they lead you in the sense of you're on CO's side in terms of he doesn't believe Park, that he makes Park, th- um, sorry, Park makes Bark falsely confess and he pre-recorded, sorry, pre-organized uh, and planned out his false confession before they recorded it. And Park kept saying, no, like, I- I'm telling you, I didn't. That's what I'm telling you. I think he's guilty because how else does he know all these details aren't released to the public? And about the third of the movie, CO clicks and he asks Park when they kind of, once they get along and they've been trying to just put their differences aside and just want to catch this bastard. They've had a bonding moment and CO has a thought and he goes, Park, like, did you, like, swear to me, did you actually plant evidence and get Bark to falsely confess or not? And Park says, no, I told you. I think he's guilty because he knew all the details and they really listened, they listened to the tape and realized that Bark, in certain points, he's talking as if he was speaking for someone else. Like, he watched someone do it, and they think, oh, shit, like, it's him. And then the brawl unfolds, and then he obviously gets hit by a train, and that's, like, they're literally the only lead, really, until they come across the prime suspect, the third suspect, that uh, turns out the DNA is inconclusive. Uh, just a bit of trivia as well, doing research on the real cases. The DNA wasn't sent to America at all. It was actually sent to Japan. I think they just did America just so they could just mention America and, you know, American audiences go, oh, yeah, you know, we're mentioned like they, th- I guess they think it might have um, been a positive spin to the um, American viewers, I'm assuming. 
can't think of any other reason why they would have changed from Japan to America, but um, yeah, and if you're still listening and you don't care about spoilers and you haven't watched the movie, there is no conclusive ending to this movie because when this was released in 2003, the killer hadn't actually been caught yet, but the killer did actually, in fact, well, I can't say caught, but he confessed in 2019 to all the rapes and murders that this was based on, that he was the serial murderer and rapist. But South Korean law is different. There is a statute of limitations on even the heinous of crimes, like murder and rape and all that. And they couldn't do anything to this guy because the statute had run out, and I think that's why he confessed. But he was already serving life imprisonment for the murder and rape of his sister-in-law, which I obviously happened, I think, a few years after the um, raping and murders had stopped uh, in this... Uh, uh, let's see if I can pronounce this, in the Hwasong district. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's glad that they've kind of got closure. I don't know if they ever actually did DNA testing because they technically they can't because the statute's out, so they probably wouldn't get a warrant to be able to do that. And you ask yourself, why would this bloke confess to murders and rapes that he didn't do? Well, the statute had run out. He knew he wasn't going to get um, even a slap across the wrist for it. Maybe he wanted to add to his name. Bit of notoriety in prison, I'm not sure. But it seems to me like he did do it because he did fit the description and whatnot. And if there's anyone out there that's watched the movie and they, and they watched the last movie and are a bit confused about uh, well, the scene that I read out where Park is told by the little girl that she pretty much had spoken to the killer because he was reminiscing about his first murder there. And Park is shaken and looks into the camera once she says he looks ordinary. Well, I was kind of right when I watched this, and then once I did research, it answered my question. When he stares into the camera, uh, he is essentially looking, using his shaman eyes, quotation mark, to see if one of the audience members is the killer. Because once again, killer hadn't been caught by the release of this movie, and it's ordinary looking. So they were pretty much leaning into the fact that this could be anyone. Like, he's ordinary looking. He, he literally could be anyone. Now, I thought that was a fitting ending to a, a case that didn't have an actual ending at that point in time and Bong didn't want to make up a fictional ending to lead people to think that this case was really solved and for the victims to just be forgotten because, you know, the killer had been caught or anything like that. He wanted to let the viewers know that, no, no, like the killer is still out there. Well, at that point, they thought he was, but he'd been in jail since, I think, 94, 95. Um, I think the ending is satisfying enough, in, in my opinion. When I was watching this, I thought that the killer had just been caught. I think the way the story was going and whatnot, I honestly thought that we were going to get an answer to who the killer was. Uh but as it unfolded before, like when they realized the DNA was inconclusive, and I thought, well, this movie, like in its movie storytelling of the three victims, sorry, three suspects that they uh, interview and of the three only major suspects, the third one is by far the most compelling, but also the not concrete evidence, but there's a lot of evidence against him. The only evidence that could really nail the bastard was a DNA, and it didn't happen. So that was the the storytelling. Like I don't, from what I can gather, the victims. Oh, I keep saying victims. The uh, people they thought did the crime. Uh, from what I can gather, none of them were actually based on any real suspects or anything like that. From the research I've done, uh, they're kind of just made up and there are also you know three different categories of type of person you have that you like this first one you've seen a lot of movies the misunderstood or the um, mentally handicapped person or you know and or the deformed person the town uh joke that people make fun of for no reason just because they look a bit different or whatever that uh i don't, I don't want to say trope or cliche because i think uh in this Park fits that role and it, it really uh, fits the movie and the story they were telling about Park and about uh, his right-hand man who would, yeah, just beat up uh, innocent people, really. And then the second one, you kind of have 
the one that looks like the killer, like he could be a killer because he's very uh, mysterious and he, like a bit of, you know, he, he was wanking on the side of a murder and a rape and wearing women's underwear. But that's kind of like a red herring in sense. No, no, he's just a fucked up weird individual who has a hard life looking after his sick wife and working all the time, looking after a bunch of kids as well. And he's really leans into his sexuality and uses that as a release. Then you have your third one where, you know, he's good looking. He's seems like he's very intelligent. He's also uh, a bit of a closed book, a bit of a smart ass, kind of like he's rubbing it in. Uh, but then at the end, we see him kind of like understand the situation he's in and really panic and like, you know, scared for his life. And he confessed and said, is that what you want to hear? Kind of telling the audience that, oh, is he actually the killer? And we don't get that answer. Um, and not, I don't even want to say unfortunately, because like I said, the, the story that this was telling wasn't solely on the killer getting caught, more so suggestion than anything. Um, and what I like about now you don't see really the killer you don't even really see much of a silhouette of the killer at all other than when he lunges and gets out of the reeds at the woman and when you see close up of his hands a little silhouette of his head and stuff they actually use three different um, people for those shots because Bong wanted to keep the audience guessing and, and not get familiar with the killer which I think was just a great touch and the second suspect, the one wearing the women's underwear, actually was one of those people that was used as a killer. Not sure. I couldn't find exactly what scenes he did, but he was one of the three, which I found was really interesting. The um, music was awesome. Like, it actually started off like a Miyazaki movie. Like, I was watching a Studio Ghibli movie, which kind of catches to be off guard, but it's kind of setting the scene of this small uh, South Korean province this kind of like, you know, a bit of a farmy type place. I thought I did a really good job setting the scene. And then you have like the dramatic music and the really dramatic scenes. Just the music works really, really well in this movie. I mean, the acting is just, ha ah, man. Like, Song Kang Ho as Park. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I want to say the performance is better than his performance in Parasite because he's great in that. But we definitely get more of him in this. So I'd be more likely to say this is the better performance only because he gets more screen time. Um, King King Sang Kyung as Seo Tae Hyun, the um, big shot soul detective, is great. Like the chemistry between him and Song is like next level fantastic. And then you have uh, Kim Roy Ha as Cho. Uh, he's Park's right hand man, like his partner, and he's the one that physically assaults. Uh, all the innocent uh, people. And he also has to get his leg amputated later on the movie after getting stabbed with a rusty nail and getting tetanus. And uh, yeah, you have uh, Officer Kwon Kui OK. Uh, she's the... Uh, I don't know if she's a police officer or a detective because she's wearing kind of like a police officer uniform, but that might just be a gender thing. I'm not entirely sure. I apologize for not researching that more, but... She was great, and the, the, they did an awesome job at showing that back in the 80s that women weren't as respected as they should have been in the police force uh, in South Korea at the time. Well, that's what the movie tells me anyway. I'm not going to sit here and say that I knew that 100%, but Park is definitely one that kind of like poo-poos her uh, idea that the killer is playing a certain song every time he kills and rapes someone, and it turns out to be true in terms of the movie, obviously. And yeah, what we see of her is really good, and she has like some really good dialogue with the kids. Really good to talk with the schoolgirls. Uh, oh, speaking of the schoolgirls, that reveal of um, Co realizing that the victim that was murdered when he was meant to be staking out the third uh, suspect was one of the schoolgirls he befriended. Like the main one he befriended that he ended up banging up because she got her at school and he was interviewing her about like the story about the the toilets and whatnot and he looks and sees the band-aid on her back that he put there for her and he just like changes and he pulls her shirt down and pulls her pants up to cover it and they say like what are you doing like you're touching the crumbs and he just storms off like it shit's about to go down even park realizes like oh fuck and that's when he goes off and 
pretty much tries to kill the uh, third and main suspect. And to actually do research and find out that Kim, as the movie progressed, he purposefully got less sleep and ate less and ate um, worse things for him as the movie progressed to show that his character was deteriorating because he wanted to solve the case and he was not dealing with the fact that the um, schoolgirl had been raped and murdered and whatnot. That shows, shows sorry, the dedication that he had. And he was, like, top level in this movie. And I have to say, like, all the cast in this movie is just incredibly good. Like, you have the two different sergeants. We don't see a lot of the original sergeant in the second half of the movie. He's kind of replaced by another... I think he's, like, a bigger shot sergeant from, uh, like, Saul or somewhere bigger because he has more of an influence and a bit more hard-nosed than the previous one. But they both do a very good job. And um, going back to the scene where the first sergeant is talking to Park about his shaman eyes and how he can point anyone out and see if they're guilty or not. There's these two blokes sitting next to each other. They're signing paper. They both look a bit disheveled. They both got bruises. They both look a bit worried. They're both giving each other side eyes. The sergeant asks Park, all right, one of these is a rapist who was caught trying to rape the other one's sister and the other one beat him up and then brought him in to be arrested. Now, tell me which one's which. And Park looks with his eyes. He's staring at them. It, it pans into his face and then it cuts and we never get an answer. And the more I think about it, after watching the movie and whatnot and seeing Park, I think he got it wrong. Because that was that was the big swerve in Bong showing us what kind of detective excuse me, the Park was. That it starts off as Park, you think, is going to be this hotshot detective and he can't solve this big crime, so he gets another hotshot detective, but they still kind of bicker a bit. But no, no, that, that's just, like I said, is not the case. Park is extremely incompetent, but it also, I think, goes to the fact, because I mentioned it multiple times, where him and other police force aren't used to this type of thing. I mean, no one is. Serial killings weren't a thing back then. Like, serial killer wasn't a term. And for these heinous crimes to keep happening in the same way by the same person, completely caught him off guard and he just wanted to close the case. He just wanted it done. And yeah, I just love the way they tell that. And what, another bit of trivia early, but what I find, out, find amazing was when CO uh, finally gets uh, to, the, to the town... He follows a woman to ask her for directions and she mistakes him for, you know, like a predator. And Park comes to be driving past and gets out of his car and starts to assume that he's a predator and starts to fight him. And this scene is like crazy because Park does a drop kick straight out of wrestling and it looks like he fully hits her. And I thought, that's good direction because that looked like it was real. And I found out that that whole scuffle, that whole fight scene was completely done on the fly. Like... The actor playing So, uh, sorry, Kim had no idea that Song was gonna throw a drop kick at it, drop kick, sorry, at him, and that's just crazy that that was done on the fly because that was a highlight of the first half of the movie for sure. Uh, trying to think of other things to touch on. I mean, yeah, this movie just it it left me wanting more, but not in a bad way, not in the sense of oh, you know, they didn't answer this, they didn't answer that, or they didn't give me enough of this and they gave me too much of that. It was more so, wow, I could just watch an entire fucking TV series of this type of story with this type of direction, with this type of writing, with this type of acting, with this type of cinematography. Like, But I think that's a good thing. When a movie leaves you wanting more, but you're satisfied. And I think Bong's always done an incredible job of that, always. And this just cements that. And I... I do honestly believe this is Bong's best movie, and I'm a big Parasite fan. Like, I recommend only a few foreign language movies to people that don't watch foreign language movies. I'm like, you have to watch it. Just give it a chance. It's so good. Memories of Murder is now one. Parasite is one. Mongol is one. Incredible movie, by the way. It doesn't get talked about enough. Those are now the three that I'm going to be recommending a lot more. And uh, Forgotten 
is another fantastic Asian thriller movie. Uh, I think it's still on Netflix. Uh, that if you love movies like this, you should check out Forgotten. It's really, really good. Not as good as this, but it's really good. It's hard to compare movies to this because they'll come off second best most of the time. And I talked about comparisons of this and Seven. I think the bleakness of this in Seven and also like the two very different cops. Not so much like with Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman, you had kind of the difference of one was a young hot shot, didn't really follow the the book as much. And you have Morgan Freeman, the older detective that did follow the book and has this great story career. Where we go to these two memories of murder, it's more so they're both from very different places, very different backgrounds. They both have very different morals, very different education, clearly. And it just works. I don't want to use the, the cliche of good cop, bad cop, because that kind of gets flipped on its ass you know, in the end of the movie. But it's more so just a comparative thing of these two blokes could not be any more different, but yet they still find a way to work together. Ultimately, they don't solve the crime, or solve the murders and rapes, but they get close enough and they feel as though they probably should have got closure with the DNA test confirming that the third suspect was the killer. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen. Yeah, so I'll probably start to lean a plane here on this review. Um, yeah, I mean, this movie... Oh, this movie was wrongfully, wrongfully left out of all the major award shows, like I said. Um, and I know people say, oh, you know, not everyone can be nominated. Not everyone can win. I get that. I'm, I'm a big awards person. I'll, I'll be covering the Oscars in a few weeks on this show. I, I love the awards and I understand all that. But I've got the list... Of the 76, 2004 Academy Awards in front of me right now. And you have the winner of Best Picture, Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. Fair enough. Fucking hard to argue with that, okay? The nominees are Lost in Translation, Master and Commander, Mystic River, Sea Biscuit. Mystic River, phenomenal movie. Probably one of, if not the best, Clint Eastwood movie made. Okay? Great movie. Same as Lord of the Rings. Great movie. But I will fucking literally put my foot down and stand by this until the day I die. Memories of Murder is better than Lost in Translation, better than Sea Biscuit, and fuck me, it shits all over Master and Commander. Are you serious? Master and Commander is a fun movie. It's cool. It's like a cool little swashbuckling action dr- drama movie, historical movie. But in terms of movie making and whatnot, that it doesn't hold up. I mean, come on. Come on. And then you go to Best Actor. You have Sean Penn for Mystic River. Fair enough. Deserve the win. Hard to hard to argue with that. Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow in the first Pirates of the Caribbean. Hard to argue with that nomination because it was so different and it was so well received for a movie that probably shouldn't have been well received, especially for the acting. Deserved it. And then you have Ben Kingsley for House of Sand and Fog. Drew Law for Cold Mountain and Bill Murray for Lost in Translation. Now, Drew Law, Ben Kingsley, I'm sorry. I am sorry. The song Kang Ho shits a lot of both of you. Bill Murray, Lost in Translation, probably on par, I have to say. It's been a long time since I've watched that movie. I would definitely say I would watch Memories of Murder many, many times before I would watch, watch Lost in Translation again. But yeah, then you have... You know, best foreign language film. And it's hard to say I haven't seen all these movies. But it, you have The Barbarian Invasions from Canada Win, was French-Canadian, if you're wondering. Then you have Evil from, Evil, sorry, from Sweden, The Twilight Samurai from Japan, Twin Sisters from Netherlands, and Zaleri from Czech Republic. Yeah, it blows my mind that Memories of Murder didn't get nominated for that category. Let alone Parasite won that category and then won Best Film and then won Best Director and then I think won Best Screenplay as well. Boggles my mind. But I think a lot of people have said, I've been reading a lot of experts and watching a lot of experts talk about it online. They think that Bong winning for a Parasite and the movie itself winning was kind of them fixing their mistakes with memories of murder and the host not getting any love, even in nominations. And I agree with that. And that's not to take away from Parasite because I think it should have won anyway. I think it's one of the best um, best pictures winners of the last 10 years and, and also one of the best movies of the last 10 years. Memories of Murder, definitely one of the, the best movies of the 2000s. No doubt. No doubt in my mind. I can't fucking be more positive about this movie if I tried. 
Uh, as I, yeah, land the plane. Uh, this was based on a play of the same name from the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. And it was also based on another play as well uh, that wasn't directly connected. Uh, and I, I might as well, I've already touched on um, Bong's career and, and you should watch all the movies in his library, all of them. Uh, I'll jump into some trivia. There's a lot of trivia, so bear with me. It's quite extensive, but beginning in June 2000, it took Bong Joon-ho a year to write the script for Memories of Murder. Yet, he has stated that for the first six months, I didn't write a line of the script. I just did research. I've already mentioned that before. In order to make his character Detective CO look properly worn out by the stress of the case, actor Kim Sang-kyung deliberately limited his food intake and slept fewer hours. That's what I was touching on before. That's just dedication from actors I just love and appreciate so much. One deleted scene shows Detective Cho walking in a red light district and then getting a message from a girl as he asks her about possible leads regarding the murders. The scene was shot in a real red light district in the city of Jeonju and featured real sex workers. They had to ask a local pimp for permission to film. One, that's crazy that that didn't even make the final cut of the movie because going through all that and like... Yeah, that's that's actually pretty crazy. Uh, Bong Joon-ho has stated that the script for Memories of Murder was directly influenced by Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell's comic book From Hell, and they was also a bit disappointed with the Hughes Brothers' film of it. Yeah, so to compare Memories of Murder to the From Hell movie is kind of like a nothing discussion or a nothing comparison, but to compare Memories of Murder to the graphic novel From Hell, I agree with Bong that that was great inspiration, and, and I watching it, I could tell that he had got inspiration from that in terms of focusing not on seeing a lot of the killings and all that, but focusing on certain aspects of the case and the cops and whatnot. Really good. Many viewers mistook Kwok Seo Young as Detective Park's wife and also thought they were at their home in scenes when they are together. She's actually a prostitute and they're at a brothel. That's what I mean. That blew my mind. I can't believe. I literally thought they were just in like a rundown apartment and they were married. The first jump kick and scuffle from Park was improvised by actor Song Kang Ho. That's well, I stated earlier. That's just awesome. I love that so much. Despite the film being based on a series of real murders in the Korean provincial town of Wang Seong during the 1980s, Bong Joon Ho also drew a lot of inspiration from a play called Come See Me, which dramatized the incidents to the extent that he stated in an interview, "If it weren't for Kim Gwang Rim's play, I would have had a lot of problems establishing the structure." While he also gained the idea for the depiction of the era from the graphic novel From Hell by the writer Alan Moore, which was given to Bong by the journalist Tony Raines as a gift. Thank you, Tony, for that, because you just created a, an amazing train of events, so thank you. When Quang Ho was investigated in the basement of the police station, the two police officers and a suspect watched a TV program while eating their meals. The title of his program is Su Sa Banjang, which can be loosely interpreted as Investigation Squad in English. It was a famous TV detective drama which was aired for almost 20 years. The opening music was also very popular during that time. Director Quentin Tarantino named it along with Bong's The Host as one of the, his top 20 favorite movies since 1992. Hard to disagree with, Quentin. Early on in the film, when Detective Park mentions having shaman's eyes, Sergeant Koo points to two men who have been brought to the police station. He says one of them is a rapist and the other is a victim's brother and asks him which one is the rapist. It is never revealed which one is which and according to director writer Bong Joon-ho, not even he knew while directing. It was never decided. Oh, well, there you go. So me kind of leaning towards the fact that they were insinuating that he got it wrong, I was I was wrong. It was kind of just an open-ended thing. There you go. The shots of the first murdered woman inside the culvert were filmed at a different time. Inside a grain processing factory and not actually in the one in which Detective Park looks into next to the field. This was to protect the actress and for lighting control. The bugs on her face were added digitally. There you go. Uh, actor Sang Kang Ho and director Bong Joon Ho's first collaboration. And I think Song has been in all of his movies since. Maybe barring one. Unlike the movie, the real killer's first victim was one Im, who was already 71 at the time of her murder. The last victim was 69. Uh, we'll find one more here. Um, the, this film is in the official top 250 narrative feature films on Letterboxd. Doesn't surprise me. 
I would actually love to see what number this is on Letterboxd at the moment for narrative feature films because it should be in the top 50 at least. At least. Uh, there's also a South Korean movie named Memoir of Murder. So don't be don't be confused. Uh, oh, we'll do one more. The first suspect back, Gwang Ho, only eats the fried dumplings because he can't use chopsticks due to his hands being burned from a fire incident. So that's also why Seo realizes that he couldn't have done the murder because he physically couldn't tie the knots and be physical with the victims or whatnot. So yeah, that pretty much brings uh, this episode towards the end. Um, I won't bother doing my ratings and stuff. I'll leave that to the uh, new release movies that will go towards the uh, end tally of the year for top top 10 best received and top 10 worst received movies. But in terms of directing, acting, writing, cinematography, this would be... Excuse me. I'm not going to say anything... I'm not going to come out here and say this is a perfect movie and the greatest movies of all time, but I honestly think it should be in discussion, especially in terms of either foreign language films or thriller murder mystery movies. Definitely. I I would rate this better than Seven. Probably on par with Silence of the Lambs. Big call, I know, but and they're quite different, definitely in terms of tone and pace. And Speaking of pacing, this is the king of pacing. If... People talk about pacing of movies and it can rule movies or if it's good, it can like make a movie. This this pacing, like a lot of directors and movie makers should watch this movie to learn how to do fucking pacing. That's all I can say. Anyway, so yeah, next week I'm hoping to uh, review Baghead, the uh, new horror movie releasing next week. Again, a lot of these new release movies, I, I really like to post new episodes on Fridays. So it really only gives me... Uh, Thursday afternoon and evening or maybe early Friday afternoon to watch the movie before I uh, review, record and publish uh, around 6, 7 p.m. on a Friday night. Uh, so if bag if I can't watch Baghead into a later date, that might be a bonus episode on Sunday and I might actually do Bob Marley if it's a better time for me or I might do another classic movie to fill the void. And then a lot of these, you know, are subject to change. Like I said, all depends on my scheduling and the movie times as well. But then the following week, hopefully, I'll do uh, June part two. June part two. Uh, then following week, the new horror movie Imaginary. And then uh, a couple of days later, I'll be doing the Oscars preview predictions. Then a few days later, I'll be doing the Oscars review. And then I uh, won't reveal anything else just in case a lot of things happen and scheduling wise, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, guys, thank you uh, so much. For listening, thank you uh, for the support. Uh, yeah, it means a lot. Uh, I know it's it sometimes might be hard or a bit boring to listen just a, a solo pod, podcaster, and I do have plans of having some guest uh, co-hosts come on. I've already lined up a few. I just wanted to really just get to the groove of things, get my schedule kind of cemented in by myself at least for a month or two, and then I'll start bringing people on and, and whatnot and... Be sure to follow me on all my socials. They're all under Goose Talks Film. You'll know the logo. Also, if you happen to pee into wrestling as well, my new podcast is dropping next week called Goose Talks Wrestling. Follow that on anywhere you get your podcast and all, across all social media so you uh, don't miss out on anything. I also have an X slash Twitter account for that. I'm working on getting one for the Goose Talks Film podcast. So, but yeah, as always, guys, if you're, if you're listening to this on any podcasting uh, program, Make sure you hit that follow button. Give me a review. If you've got a spare time, good or bad, just don't be too mean. <laughs> and if you're watching slash listen to this on YouTube, make sure to uh, hit the like button, subscribe so you don't miss out on anything. And yeah, this has been Goose. I will catch you next week. And please make sure you keep watching their movies.